Let's, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your Son, uh, your Word, who was born in flesh for us. Uh, we ask uh, that uh, your Word, uh, your Son, uh, may find his way uh, to our hearts, that we may live in faith and in freedom as your children. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, first, a follow-up on last week. Uh, we talked about the sacraments, uh, and, and uh, Stacey hasn't had a chance. I just sent this out, the link to last week's class this morning. Um, and so, uh, so people have not had a chance to watch last week's class if you missed it, but it, it's now it's on there. Um, but we talked about the sacraments, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and Penny brought up this hymn, God's Own Child, I gladly say it. But in the, the, the sacraments, uh, we were seeing uh, last week that God gives us His promises in tangible, personal ways, uh, in a way that we as, as God's children can speak and live with faith. Uh, and, and this hymn is such a great example of that, how having these kinds of promises from Jesus allow us to look at any of our uh, any of the true enemies in the eye and say, I am confident in God and His grace. And so this, you know, we can just look at the words here, this first verse, God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. He, because I could not pay it, gave my full redemption price. Do I need earth's treasures many? A good uh, question after Christmas, you know, do we need earth's treasures? Uh, that is, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the worldly kind of Christmas now with the presents under the tree and kids who still feel like they didn't get enough, you know. Do I need earth's treasures many? I have one, one treasure worth more than any that brought me salvation free, lasting to eternity. That is, in my baptism, Christ has given me the treasure of his own self, uh, his forgiveness. And so again, you can speak, these next verses are wonderful because they speak, you can see verse 2, to sin. Verse 3 speaks to Satan. Verse 4 speaks to death. And you look at these things in the eye and say, Sin, disturb me, uh, my soul no longer. I am baptized into Christ. Satan, hear this proclamation. I am baptized into Christ. Death, you cannot end my gladness. I am baptized into Christ. Because I belong to Him, I am not afraid of any of these things. Um, so, anyways, I keep this hymn, look at it. It's just a great one to reflect on. Um, just a really good one to sing. You can find it online, too. It, if you're not familiar with the, the music here, um, look it up. Yeah, it's just a lovely melody too. So I really encourage you look it up. Look up this this hymn online. Um, sing along. It's just a beautiful piece. We have the children memorizing. They've, done, they've memorized two verses. Well, yeah, and they're on the third verse. Right. And so we want that embedded in. Yeah. Them. We have twelve night. We have twelve night. Yeah. We're going to, I, I, we are just bring the tiny ones with the stuff. No. Um, so today, I want to look at the Augsburg Confession. Uh, oh boy. Yeah, I know, and this is, this is more of the material than what we could get through in a class, uh, in just one session. But I want to look at this uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because this is a pivotal document, a pivotal piece of writing from church history, uh, and uh, very uh, important for us as uh, as Lutherans. Um, uh, but again, just in, in the in the course of church history, this is a pivotal moment uh, when uh, the Lutheran princes uh, were gathered together in Augsburg uh, and and were asked to defend their faith. They went to the city of Augsburg uh, and had to defend their faith. Uh, like it says, to uh, Prince, uh, uh, to His Majesty Charles V. I mean, so they're standing before the most powerful man in, in Europe, maybe you could say the po most powerful man in the world at the time, and have to give an accounting uh, for the faith uh, that is in them. Uh, and so uh, they, they get together. Now, Luther himself could not go. That's right. He was an outlaw at this time. If he had shown his face, uh, you know, if, he, if he'd shown his head, it would have been taken from him. You know, that would have been the end of Luther. So they, the, the princes insisted, Luther's friends, they insisted, you stay away from Augsburg. We will handle this one, they said. Uh, but they stayed in correspondence during this time. Uh, and uh, finally then the, the, the princes, the Lutheran princes, presented this as their confession of faith to uh, the emperor. And ever since then, 
this has been a um, uh, this has been a defining document for Lutheran churches. Uh, in fact, um, when you become a member of St. John's, actually, it is assumed uh, that you uh, subscribe to this. Now, I, again, I know in one new members class we're not going to get all the way through here. Uh, in the same way that in a new members class we can't go through all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. But over the course of your lifetime as a Christian, I do encourage you, do read the Bible. And, and um, uh, you know, get, get through the whole thing. I mean, you might not get it all done in one year, but, um, but read it. Uh, you know, and even though you haven't read the whole Bible, perhaps, by the time you become a member of our church, nonetheless, we do expect that our members uh, will say that they, uh, they share our belief that the Bible is God's Word. Uh, so in the same way, I would ask you to, to look at this now with me, that we'll go over briefly, and I, I give you this copy now, and, and would ask that in the course of your life as a Christian, look at this. If you have time, and I know you have no time whatsoever, um, as, a, as a young mom and, and uh, a dairy farmer, um, but it, as, you, as you have time, and if you can even grab snatches of time here and there, a few minutes here, uh, this is actually broken out down into little pieces so that you could read just a little bit a day. Uh, but get, get to know it. Uh, but just again, because um, uh, I, I want you to be aware of what this is, which uh, you will subscribe to. Again, as a member, it's assumed that you are subscribing uh, to this confession of faith. Uh, now, so I, there, there's the history of this document. Um, uh, you know, it was written uh, back in the year 1530, like it says. Um, uh, but uh, I, I should say that this altogether is a very, you could say, um, kind of universal Christian statement. Uh, that is, when the Lutherans were standing in front of the emperor, they were not trying to say, these are the new ideas that we just came up with. I mean, the point of, of writing this for them was to say, actually, we belong to the Christian faith as it has always been confessed. So going back to Jesus, the apostles, the early uh, fathers of the church, you know, we are in concert, we're in harmony with them. And so what you find in this, this is a very, you might say, uh, conservative document. Because what they'll do over and over and say, the church has always believed this, we believe this. Um, they eventually get to some points uh, where they'll say, now here are some points of disagreement, and so we have to pay attention to that. Uh, but it's rather interesting that, especially as you start out in this document, um, they're, they're very succinct. They don't have a lot to say. I mean, you get to, I mean, the, the first article here is, is the article about God. Now, you'd think it would take, you know, pages and pages and volumes to say, what do we believe about God? No. Uh, they're just going to say, hey, look, we believe the basics. We believe in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Again, this is what the church has always believed. This is who Christ has shown uh, himself to be. We believe this. So they don't have a lot to say. What's interesting, if you kind of turn uh, to page uh, 14, <laughs> page 14, there it says, now these are the articles about matters in dispute in which an account is given of the abuses which have been corrected. Now it's interesting, so then when you get to this part, it gets a little wor more wordy. I mean, then they have a little bit more to say uh, about what are these differences between the Lutherans and the, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but again, even generally, this is a fairly succinct document. Um, so, and, 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 and really, what is at the heart of this whole thing is a confession about Jesus uh, and His grace and how it is that we are saved by Christ. Um, and, and I've tried to, uh, I think, emphasize in this class that when you go to a, a new members class at a Lutheran church, um, it's true, you, we need to learn about our history, we need to learn about what it is that Lutherans believe, uh, but really at the heart of it all is not some kind of weird, newfangled idea that Lutherans came up with. But what Lutherans always do is point back to the Word of God, which points us to Christ and His benefits, His blessings for us. Uh, and so, uh, you know, looking at this, again, this, I don't want you to walk away from this um, uh, seeing that, that Martin Luther is at the heart of this, but that Jesus himself is at the heart of this. So, uh, look at page 7. <clears throat> look at page 7, and there you can see Roman numeral 4, <clears throat> the bottom right corner there of the page, where it says justification. Uh, this is really the hub of the wheel. Uh, it's, it's this paragraph right here where these reformers really knew how to sing. 
Now listen to this, what, what, they're, what they confess now. To the emperor, to the world, they say this. It is also taught among us that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin and righteousness before God by our own merits, works, or satisfactions, but that we receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous before God by grace, for Christ's sake, through faith, when we believe that Christ suffered for us, and that for His sake our sin is forgiven, and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. For God will reckon, regard and reckon this faith as righteousness, as Paul says in Romans 3, verses 21 to 26, and chapter 4, verse 5. Um, so there's, there's again the heart of it. Uh, that the reformers are pointing us to Christ and His benefits, which we receive by faith. Um, so th this is this question. is the hub. Yes. What was the response of the emperor to that <coughs> particular? To that particular piece? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how the emperor responded to that. Now we could look in the Book of Concord, um, where you get uh, what's called. This is the the Augsburg Confession. And then you get what's called the apology, yep, to the Augsburg Confession. And apology just means defense. Um, and so uh, where, where Melanchthon then uh, responds to the responses. And so, I mean, you would, I mean, uh, you get a good sense there um, of, of how it was that the, the, the Catholic teachers responded um, and, and Charles with them uh, under, under their influence. Um, so, you know, that's a good question. There are probably some good documents about that, about how they responded. Um, they didn't like it. I mean, the, the basic idea was um, the Catholic teaching then and to this day is that faith saves, uh, but only if faith is made alive by works. It, you know, and, and they're echoing James there. You know, faith without works is dead. Um, but the trouble is, faith without works, I mean, is no faith. I mean, that is because the Holy Spirit is at work to make faith, the Holy Spirit never leaves us without fruit in our lives. But, and if but, you think about it, I mean, that that James piece, faith without works is dead, Yeah, that's somebody's determination that that work is ladling soup in a soup kitchen. Yeah. Not that, that we we are able by the power of the Holy Spirit to confess that Christ is Lord. Yeah, is Lord. right. And mm -hmm. that that is... I yeah. would think in the world of works, that would be a work of some yeah. form, or yeah. some some outgrowth of right, faith. right, yeah. And and I think the I like the ladle analogy. Um, I think this is actually a helpful way of seeing a distinction between a Lutheran and a Catholic understanding of faith. Uh, that is, um, a, a Catholic theologian might describe faith as something like an empty cup waiting to be filled with love. You know, and that if 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 all you've got is that empty cup, well, that's great and all, but you're not quite there yet. Uh, whereas a Lutheran would say, faith uh, is always full because faith is grabbing onto Jesus and his righteousness. So there's, there's no such thing as a truly an empty faith. Because if you have Christian faith at all, uh, what you've got is the Word of God, and you have a heart grabbing onto that Word. Um, so that, I mean, I think that would be how they would respond to that, is to say, um, well, again, yeah, faith is good, uh, but it's not complete. Uh, you know, Luther, in his translation of Romans, I mean, he got into trouble for this, um, is that when he translated Romans in saying we are saved by faith, he, he added this word alone. We are saved, justified by faith alone. Now, it's funny because Luther wasn't the first one to do that. I mean, there were ca other Catholic translators who had done that themselves. Uh, and, Lu and Luther would, would say, look, I know that word alone is not in the Greek, uh, but to make this good German... And to really get what Paul is saying here, what Paul is doing is peeling away, in, that, in Romans chapter 3, he's peeling away from faith anything, anything else uh, in addition to faith that would justify us and make us right with God. So that when he gets to this statement, we are justified by faith, it's, it's truly implied in everything he's saying. That the word really belongs there, even though the Greek doesn't use it, Luther would say the German really has to, to be clear about what Paul is saying. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, the Catholics would respond and say, well, yeah, you're right, we're saved by faith. And it's funny, now even the 20th century, later 20th century, the Lutherans and Catholics got together in some dialogues um, and created this joint, it's something called the Joint, uh, joint doc, Doctrine? No, a Joint doc, Declaration. Think of the Joint Declaration on the uh, Doctrine of Justification. J 
JDDJ for short, um, where Lutheran and the Catholics came up with a statement about faith and grace that they could both agree on. Yeah. Now the problem was, we, we mean different things when we use the terms. Yeah. And, and you have to be clear about these terms, that the differences, there are these differences persist. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to paper, paper over them, but we still have our differences, and I think that would be the key thing, is what do we mean by we're saved by faith? Faith alone? Yes, because faith is not just this empty cup waiting to be filled, but because faith is already grabbing on to Jesus, and faith has Jesus, and faith has his righteousness. Um, so it's not just like faith is a nice virtue that I have, but faith holds Christ. And if I'm holding Christ, I've got all the righteousness I need. Um, I think Clement, Clement Grace at the time that was having said, so you'll know they, they meant it if the rosaries are gone. Yeah, well, right, right, right. I know, you have to, yeah. I mean, uh, you can see how much it, how much impact it really has. And when a bunch of academics get, get together at a conference and decide something, who cares? I mean, um, so right, it, it doesn't mean that much. And, and the words, again, the words, how we define them matter. And in the end, you can see not a whole lot's changed. Oh, some things have changed. And I'm glad that Lutherans and Catholics can be good neighbors to one another. And there may have been times where, you know, it was harder to have neighborly relations or something. So I'm glad, you know, we can have good neighborly relations. But I want to be clear about what we teach so that we, again, can continue to point to Christ and say, if you have Jesus by faith, you have everything you need. Um, so I want to walk through this just a little bit in, in kind of summary fashion here, point by point. Um, and, and again, read. Well, eventually you can read this on your own. I encourage you to do so. Uh, they start with this teaching about God. Nothing real flashy here or, or new. Um, uh, they, uh, they believe that God is one in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You can look at the second paragraph there on page 7 where it says, Therefore, all the heresies which are contrary to this article are rejected. Among these are the heresy of the Manichaeans, who assert that there are two gods, one good and one evil. Also that of the Valentinians, Arians, Eunomians, uh, Mohammedans, uh, we would say Muslims today, um, and others like them. Also that of the uh, Samo Samosatanians, old and new, who hold that there is only one person. I mean, uh, they go through all these heresies and say, we do not accept these. Again, the, the Lutherans here are trying to say, we agree with you people. They're, I mean, they're, they're starting on, the, on very uh, safe territory, very safe ground here. Like, we share this in common. Uh, those all old heresies, we reject them too. Um, I mean, the Lutherans were being accused, of course, of being heretics. So they're trying to say, look, we're not on the side of heresy. We are on the side of the Christian faith as it has always been taught. So point number two, Roman number two, original sin uh, it is taught among us. That since the fall of Adam, all men who are born according to the course of nature are conceived and born in sin and so forth. Uh, Roman numeral three, the Son of God. It is taught among us that, the, that God the Son became man, born of the Virgin Mary. I mean, in some ways, we're just going through the creed here. I mean, this is, this is the basics. This is just good catechism stuff. Uh, very safe territory. Then for, uh, chapter four here, article four, this teaching on justification. Uh, where they are, I mean, this, this is, a, I, I would say, a provocative statement, what they're saying about justification, uh, even though, in a lot of ways, it shouldn't be provocative. I mean, it shouldn't provoke anybody to say, we believe that we are saved by Christ, uh, His grace, uh, through faith. Uh, but, uh, well, that is actually still contentious. But then uh, Article 5 on page 8 now it talks about the office of the ministry. I think this is an important one to say now, and this will connect with our discussion last week about the sacraments. Article 5 here says, To obtain such faith, God instituted the office of the ministry, that is, provided the gospel and the sacraments. Through these, as through means, He gives the Holy Spirit, who works faith when and where He pleases in those who hear the gospel. And the gospel teaches that we have a gracious God, not by our own merits, but by the merit of Christ, and we believe this. Condemned are the Anabaptists and others who teach that the Holy Spirit comes to us through our own preparations, thoughts, and works without the external word of the gospel. Now, it's very important there that they're saying that uh, Jesus comes to us through his word. We don't just kind of sit by ourselves in a room, turn off the lights, light a few candles, and be like, okay, Jesus, come to me. I'm ready for you. I mean, you, you know, you, we don't like just kind of meditate our way into finding Jesus. 
but we say he comes to us through his word. Uh, without that word, we don't have a connection to him. Uh, so the Holy Spirit comes to us through the word, the gospel, the spoken, preached word. It comes to us through the baptism, the Lord's Supper. Um, we don't just, again, sit by ourselves until God shows up. Um, because God is always present. But what we need is God to come to us with a promise. We need him to come to us with his gospel, with his, his forgiveness. Um, so then, uh, and now this also becomes uh, chapter, or article 6, the new obedience, is again sort of a, they're, they're defending themselves here now against those who would say, well, you Lutherans, uh, you don't think we're saved by works, so the, the good things we do, so that means you don't like works. You don't want us to do good works. You want us just, you know, like, and they, this is the same thing they said to St. Paul back in the, the New Testament, uh, where uh, Paul would say, so should we just sin that grace may abound? <laughs> no, of course not, he says. Uh, and so here in this Article 6, the Reformers say, it is also taught among us that such faith should produce good fruits and good works and that we must do all such good works as God has commanded. Uh, so do we, are we preaching against works? Heaven forbid. But, and they continue, but we should do good works for God's sake and not place our trust in them as if thereby to merit favor before God. So we do good works because we love God, not because we think our good works will build a bridge to heaven. And they continue, for we receive forgiveness of sin and righteousness through faith in Christ, as Christ himself says, so you also, when you have done all that is commanded, you say we are unworthy servants. Um, the fathers, that is the church fathers, the early uh, teachers, pastors of the church, also teach us, for Ambrose says, it is ordained of God that whoever believes in Christ shall be saved, and he shall have forgiveness of sins, not through works, but through faith alone. <laughs> through faith alone, without merit. Um, so, I mean, again, the Lutherans are defending themselves uh, against criticisms. Uh, they're defending themselves against people who are maligning them. And again, you can see this all connects back to that Article 4. I mean, the one where we started about justification. Uh, you can always tie these back. Like, see, that's kind of the hub of the wheel. Um, Natalie. Oh. This is not going to last few days. Oh, nothing. This is nothing. Yeah. It's been a long Christmas. <laughs> a long Christmas. Oh, oh the tears. Oh. Yeah, your mom got you. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and, and this, this Article 7 is going to connect now again, um, that is, if, if we are saved by faith, and if faith comes through the gospel, not just by our own attempt at becoming faithful, again, God, is need, God has a place where he does this. He does this in the church. So, it is also taught among us that one holy Christian church will be and remain forever. This is the assembly of all believers among whom the gospel is preached in its purity, and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. For it is sufficient for the true unity of the Christian church that the gospel be preached in conformity with the pure understanding of it, and that the sacraments be administered in accordance with the divine word. It is not necessary for the true unity of the Christian church that ceremonies instituted by men should be observed uniformly in all places. Now, again, this this is this is an argument going on. Um, the reformers are trying to demonstrate that they are in continuity with the church throughout the ages, but they are making a, a defense of their teaching here against Rome, against the Roman Church, which said that uh, you sure it's good to have preaching, but if you don't if you're not sort of under the umbrella of the Pope, you don't have a church. I mean, this would, be, this would be Rome's way of looking at it, is that you need the papal office. You need, the, and the way they would say this, you need the successor to St. Peter. I mean, this is, this is the Pope. The Bishop of Rome is the successor to St. Peter. And without that, you don't have a true church. Uh, you might do a lot of nice religious things, but without the Pope, it doesn't count. You don't have a real church. You're not part of the real church. And the reformists here are saying, no, What's necessary, what is sufficient for the church, it says, 
is that the gospel is preached and that the sacraments are given, just like Christ commanded us. Um, other ceremonies are fine. We can, you know, again, like we said last time, you can light candles on Christmas Eve, you know, uh, but if you don't, it's not going to be the end of the church. Uh, your pastor might put on a black suit and wear a little white collar. That's fine. Not necessary for the church. What's necessary is the word of Christ. You preach his word. Um, that That is sufficient. So again, there, there's an argument going on in this, uh, even though they are, again, trying to demonstrate their continuity with the church throughout the ages. I know you're trying to get through a whole lot here. I'm yeah, it's okay. So much of what I hear today is exhortation. Mm-hmm, sure. And where do they get that? The, word, the preaching of the law? Yeah, I, I mean... Yeah. Because we trust in our own abilities more than we trust in God to accomplish things. Uh, we exhort, we command, we you know tell people shape up because we don't believe that God will really accomplish things in his own ways and his time. We've got to do it ourselves. Yeah, and, and because the, the fruits of the kingdom can often be hidden from our eyes. Um, I would go again to the, the parable Jesus tells about the sheep and the goats. Where Jesus thanks, yeah, yeah, he thanks the sheep for caring for him, and they don't even know what he's talking about. So what bothers me about this whole thing, mm -hmm. <coughs> we emphasize the distinction between law and gospel, and good Lutheran yeah. preachers preach both. Mm -hmm. And in the exhortation ones, it's basically all law. Right. And so many of those are growing so sure, so well. Yep. Yeah. But, but, you know, part attraction? of that is also yeah. just style and sort of appealing mm -hmm. to a lot of some yeah. modern whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you think about that, even that first article, here's God, we just say it clearly, three persons, mm -hmm. one God. I, I think the, the, the interesting thing for the Christian church today is to embrace what it is, embrace the clarity of the gospel and yeah. keep teaching it. But yeah. but yeah. then you get a, a group of sort of whatever kind of something Lutheran, something or others, or that want to apologize for everything that yeah. that is the gospel. Yeah. And and so just keep preaching you know, and your and that sort of notion that just keep preaching the clear mm -hmm. clear gospel. And it, yeah. you know, we don't have I mean, yeah. I think churches are spending way too much time trying to think about how can we be more exciting, mm -hmm. more inviting. Yeah. I, I mean, I, they don't have to work at being, making the so, word dull. Yeah. yeah, and I, I yeah. yeah. So I think I mean, what, what Penny's pointing to is that there, there may be many factors at why church, certain well, churches grow. For quite some time, people want to be entertained. Yeah, but 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 what she's also talking. I mean, that's one factor. But another factor is clarity. I mean, that there, there. I think some of those churches may be doing a good job of speaking clearly. For of long. not. Of, yeah, and what. They're, they might not be, the thing that they're speaking clearly might not in the end be sufficient uh, as to what God really wants to be preached, but at least for, for the human ears that are listening, they're able to, I think those preachers might be at least doing a good job of, of keeping their attention and giving them lessons in life that they find practical. Now again, we know that this that's not sufficient because practical lessons for life in the end will just leave you burned. I mean, or... verify this. I listen to these and I where was the gospel? Right. Yeah, if that's all you, if that's all you've got as advice for this life, in the end, it's going to fall flat. You will fall flat if that's you, all you've got. You know, the other the other thing that I think is is interesting in the whole, because some of that does have the sort of works allure, because oh, we, yeah. you know, yeah. and the, the silliness of human minds to think that we could do anything to please God. Right. That we could do anything to make up the deficit right. for ourselves. Right. I mean, if you really think logically, yeah. this is the only yeah. Yeah. condition. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because right. Christ that God did this. it for us. That's right. And it makes no sense that yeah. God did it for us, but right. He did anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. and right. that everything else is Sheer just grace. A, a silly yeah. exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, churches that maybe focus more, like you were saying, on I'll say the law, but really it, it's maybe it's more around the works and all. Is it's it's more of a feel-good kind oh, of sermon. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know this yeah. is 
you know, yeah. this is what we're doing yeah. good in the world. Right. This is how we're helping people. Yeah. And it makes people, you know, combination. they make yeah. them feel it good. Is. And that's funny, is that what it is in the end, I would say, is sort of a tamed version of the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got these little doses of, yeah. again, packaged as advice for your life, which feels nice. Oh, there's a little something I can work on today. Whereas, again, when, when, when Christ preaches the law, I think we may have touched on this when we did law gospel here. When Christ preaches the law, he rips it open. He doesn't just give you these nice little packages for your daily life today. You know, just go home and smile at someone today. No, uh, that's not Jesus preaching the law. I mean, he says, when the law says don't uh, commit adultery, you know, it's even that that is even attacking your lust, your thoughts. I mean, when the law says don't kill, it's attacking your anger. It's attacking the the the, the words, the, the the cruel words you speak to one another. I mean, Jesus is labeling us all adulterers, murderers, idolaters. I, you know, so again, Jesus doesn't give us little packages. We like little packages. You know, that tamed version of, of the law. But um, yeah, Christ's law is really quite uh, well. It's it's deadly. I mean, it it attacks us. I mean, and, and so that, I mean, God can raise us to life. Um, so, yeah, a lot of factors, I would say, that go into why do people, you know, why do some churches grow? I don't know. I, in the end, we shouldn't worry too much about it. I mean, focus on what God has given us mm -hmm. to do. I mean, here's our task here in Howard Lake. Let's preach the gospel and see what results the Spirit brings to us. I mean, that was one little thing here in page 8, where in, in that uh, Roman numeral 5, in the middle of that paragraph, it says, uh, He gives the Holy Spirit who works faith when and where He pleases in those who hear the gospel. So it happens through the gospel, but you know we can't always predict when this will happen. You know, we, we, we do what we've been told. We throw the word out there, and God will do with that as He desires. Um, now, I'm going to keep racing here. Um, Sorry. No, no, not at all. I mean, this is so good, and it's a shame to, you know, go quickly. So I, I like you the really questions. Need to have some class. This, this, yeah, this, yeah, right here. Huh? This would be a great class. And and I, and I know our interim pastor before I was here did teach a class on this, um, but it would be great to revisit it because um, I think this covers so much material here. Uh, page nine, so we get to baptism. We talked about this last time. Uh, and then it says here, I mean, clearly, um, uh, baptism is necessary, grace is offered through it. Children, too, hey, Natalie, <laughs> children, too, should be baptized, for in baptism they are committed to God and become acceptable to Him. So on this account, the Anabaptists, who teach that infant baptism is not right, are rejected. And then moving on also to the Holy Supper of our Lord, uh, that this is truly Christ's body and blood. Um, confession, uh, number 11 here. Uh, that I love this. It is taught that private absolution should be retained and not allowed to fall into disuse. Um, that is, Lutherans have no trouble with private confession. That, but now they'll state their differences. However, in confession, it is not necessary to enumerate all trespasses and sins, for this is impossible. Um, that, no, so now they are showing the distinction. They're saying, okay, we like confession. But the way you've been doing it uh, has been uh, putting people back in bondage instead of freeing them. Because the priest would say, well, are you sure you got everything? Are you sure? You know, uh, and only once you've confessed everything, then I will give you that absolution. Uh, whereas, I mean, the reformers are looking at the Bible here and saying, none of us can remember or point to all of our sins. Um, we, we confess, and that's important that we do that. Uh, but we receive forgiveness because of Jesus and his cross. Not because we have been sufficiently contrite. Um, and so again, the reformers are pointing out a difference between themselves and the Catholic Church here. But nonetheless saying, hey, we're still going to keep confession, but let's do it uh, in a way that actually frees consciences from the burden of their sin. Um, repentance, in a similar way now. Uh, they're going to talk about what repentance of sins is. Uh, True repentance, and I'm going to skip ahead here to the next uh, top of page 9, that next second column. Properly speaking, I say, true repentance is nothing else than to have contrition and sorrow or terror on account of sin, and yet, at the same time, to believe the gospel and absolution. Uh, 
So, namely, that sin has been forgiven and grace has been obtained through Christ. Um, so, now, going a little bit further down that, to that next paragraph, it said, uh, rejected here are those who teach that persons who have once become godly cannot fall again. Um, uh, and, and then at the very end of that, of that section, rejected also are those who teach that forgiveness of sin is not obtained through faith, but through the satisfactions made by man. So again, the reformers are kind of thinking about their own history in the Catholic Church, uh, where you'd go to the priest, and the priest would say, you are forgiven, but now uh, you've got to sort of work this off, say so many Hail Marys, uh, you know, I want you to make sure you give your, your, your money to the church, um, whatever it is, you need to do something to sort of work out these penalties. Uh, and the reformers would say, no, again, we're forgiven on account of Christ. Uh, before God, uh, we have complete forgiveness. Um, because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, continuing on, racing through here, uh, the section 13, the use of the sacraments, um, uh, that the, the, they are signs, it says, in the middle of this paragraph, they are signs, the baptism, Lord's Supper, signs and testimonies of, of God's will toward us for the purpose of awakening and strengthening our faith. Uh, and so it says they require faith. Uh, we, we must believe these promises because the sacraments give us testimonies from God. I mean, it, it, it is God's Word attached to a physical thing. Because this is a way of receiving God's Word, we need to trust that Word. I mean, it, it's, it works the, sacraments work much the same way as preaching. If we do not believe what Christ is telling us, uh, we miss out. We, we are not receiving them, using them properly. Um, then, uh, order in the church, now page 10. This is interesting, very briefly. It is taught among us that nobody should publicly teach or preach or administer the sacraments in the church without a regular call. Uh, that is, um, God has called me to this ministry. Uh, just use myself as an example. He called me through the church. That is, I have this call, not because I just think, you know, I think I'm really going to be a preacher. That would be good for me. No, I, I, this church uh, gave me a call. I mean, that God's call came through St. John's, uh, which uh, voted a meeting, issued a letter of call to me. Uh, and so these were things that I didn't just dream up, but that God called this pastor to the church. And that this is saying, we don't just go around preaching and baptizing because we feel like it, uh, but we do it because God has told us to. That's why I'm here. The, the, the distinction from the Catholic Church? Yeah. Is there any... Is that just kind of a given for them? That would be a given. And so I, I, Luther here is more yeah, dealing with some other... Uh, denominations. Denominations, yeah, in their own time. Sometimes they're called the radical reformers right. or enthusiasts, spiritualists. Uh, again, these are the people who would say, I don't need God's word. I'm just going to well, turn on the lights, light some candles. Right. I'm just going to wait for Jesus to come to me. I mean, in the same way, they would sort of say, I don't need to wait for uh, God to speak through the church. If I want to preach, I'm just going to go ahead and preach. And that, that can be very destructive. I mean, God um, gives us all different ministries to do. I mean, the, 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 the vocations we talk about, the vocations of fatherhood, motherhood, husband, wife, son, daughter. I mean, the, the vocation of, I mean, teachers, assembly line workers, all of these people contributing to the welfare of the world and also each of us contributes to the welfare of the church. Um, but there is a ministry, again, like we said last time, where like a janitor, God gives the keys of forgiveness to the church. But he also establishes a ministry so that when you need those keys, you know who to talk to. When you need your sins forgiven, when you need to be unlocked from your sins, you know you can talk to your pastor who will give you those keys. Much in the same way that at a school, uh, if you need it at a public school, really we all own that building, but if you need a certain room unlocked, you find the janitor. That's his job um, or her job. And, and so you know, my job as a pastor, I've got the keys, and so that whenever you need to hear that word preached, You'll hear it. Um, so, um, now, uh, to continue racing, uh, section 15, uh, to church usages. Um, now, uh, they're, they're going to talk here about traditions in the church, about uh, holy days, festivals. Um, uh, now, that would include Christmas. I mean, God didn't even command that we had to celebrate Christmas, or Easter for that matter. It's important that we preach these things. But it's not important that we set aside December 25th, you know, that it has to be done in a certain way. 
So we preach these things. And so that's what he says, you know, in the middle of this paragraph, church usages, traditions. We accompany these observances with instruction so that consciences may not be burdened by the notion that such things are necessary for salvation. So we can light candles on Christmas Eve. It's wonderful. But we also want to tell people uh, that these things are not what save you. <laughs> and, and, and that even if, uh, you know, goodness, Pastor, our, our church burned down, uh, we can't have our Christmas Eve service the way we used to. You could say, that's okay. I mean, if some old tradition changes, that's okay. What can't change is the preaching of Christ. You know, it also is a great little to the over-liturgics. It is. Oh, you, you bet know, it is. I mean, you in bet. their own prescient way, mm -hmm. yes. these things serve the Word, yes. not the other way you around. You got it. That's really interesting. Yeah. Honestly, I have not yeah, and, and, and Penny, you and I especially can get away with saying this because we're a couple of liturgical nerds who appreciate the liturgy, the orders of service and all that, you know, the, the Kyrie, the Gloria. Uh, but also we have to admit that, yeah, these things are in service of the Word. Uh, the church does not rise and fall on depending on how well we preserve the liturgy. Uh, that these things can be tools in service of the Word. Um, yeah, but, I just didn't realize he articulated it that yeah. kind of... Mm -hmm. Nicely there. Yeah. And everything is in perspective to the word. Right. And, and so then the last sentence of this paragraph is, accordingly, monastic, that is monks, nuns, their vows, and other traditions concerning distinctions of foods, days, etc., by which it is intended to earn grace and make satisfaction for sin, are useless and contrary to the gospel. That is, if you're going to insist that you sort of score points by fasting, mm -hmm. avoiding certain foods, I mean, then you're even working against the gospel. Um, continuing, civil government uh, simply says that, uh, that God established government and that you can even serve in government uh, in, with good conscience. Now, you could tell us, Penny, how hard it is to serve in government with a clean conscience. You're surrounded by scoundrels. But nonetheless, we do it. I mean, we, we do this. God has established government for the, for the, the preservation of, of safety in this world. Uh, so Christians can serve as soldiers. They can serve as governors, school board members, and so forth. Um, uh, so, and this, this, is a, this is an argument. I mean, here you can see um, in that second paragraph of this section, condemned here are the Anabaptists who teach that none of the things indicated above is Christian. I would say a Christian needs to stay away from all those things. Christians should not run for office. Christians should not serve in the, the military and so forth. Um, so, uh, so they're, they're saying, uh, no, we, we, we live in this world. Um, we live, uh, we'll be subject to our government. We can even participate in government. Um, those things will not save or, or condemn us. Um, but, they do say, but if the civil authority commands us uh, it, to, to sin against God, then we must obey God rather than men. And that's just, it's, that comes right out of Acts 5. Verse 29, like it says. Um, continuing, uh, chat, Article 17, the return of Christ uh, to judgment. Uh, we're looking forward to Christ's return at the end of time. I won't go into this right now, but actually in this section, this Article 17, they actually do condemn what today we think of as the rapture uh, teaching. I mean, the left behind books, Kirk Cameron and all that. Um, uh, they actually, the reformers do uh, reject that version of the end of all things. Uh, again, can't get into that too much deeply now, but I'd, I'd be happy to go into more of that in our time. Uh, Article 18, the freedom of the will. Uh, like we've said here recently, all of us has a certain measure of freedom, that is we can choose Wheaties or Cheerios, you know, one or the other. But when it comes to God, actually, uh, we